Well, this is our first uh, breakout session, and uh, Dr. Kevin Van Hooser has agreed to come and help us uh, uh, understand, live out the, the biblical faith, the biblical truth that we affirm, how to read a culture, uh, what every pastor needs to know, a primer on cultural exegesis. Uh, Kevin has been uh, uh, a friend for many, many years. Um, uh, you need to know that, that every time I've asked him to, to do something, to come and serve us in the EFCA, if he is able, he will do it. And I, Kevin, I want you to, I, in front, just to thank you. It's been greatly appreciated. Uh, Kevin has been at this for a long time. Is there a meaning in this text? He, he addresses postmodernism. And, and he's uh, everyday theology. That is, a, there's, there's a cultural exegesis that we need to be thinking about. I read an article just uh, about uh, a month ago, uh, uh, cultural hermeneutics. You're writing for a journal, a magazine, and very helpful. So uh, you are, um, uh, be prepared to be uh, helped and, and uh, uh, enabled to see these things in ways that maybe you hadn't before. Uh, Kevin has been uniquely gifted by God, and he, he eagerly longs to serve God by serving the church. As you come, brother, I would like to pray. Father, it's not a culture that motivates us, it's you. And yet it's fitting that, that once we understand you, we are motivated to reach out. It's, in some ways, it's, it's who you are, and you send your son. And so we, too, uh, are, are sent. We want to be faithful. And Lord, there's so many, uh, to some degree, tectonic shifts that are happening culturally and on, on the one hand, we can preach the word faithfully and, and, and act almost as if there is no other uh, world out there, the city of man. And yet, on the other hand, we can become so focused and preoccupied with understanding and assessing and evaluating and commenting on the city of man that we forget our foundation in the city of God. Thank you for Kevin, his friendship, and the gift gifts you've given to him, and his d desire to be faithful as a, as a servant of yours as he now serves the church. Guide him, lead him. We are, we are eager listeners and learners. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kevin, please come. Thank you, Greg. It's wonderful to have a cheerleader for theology in Minneapolis, so I appreciate that as well. And thank you all for coming. It is a privilege for me to speak with working pastors. Um, I'm acutely aware that I'm addressing people who are in a place where they can make a difference. Uh, sometimes the, the kind of difference I can only talk about. So my time is short. My title is long. Let's get right to it. Why read culture? Why should you, ministers of the word, people who've been trained to read scripture well, in the original languages no less, why should you take the time to read culture? Why read culture if you profess sola scriptura, scripture alone? Why should you be reading anything else? So let me begin by answering the why question. Then we'll move to the what questions, what is culture, what is culture for, and finally the how questions, how can we make sense of culture. So begin with asking the question, why bother trying to read, question, uh, read culture? This is a fair question. Uh, seminaries, as you know, spend most of their time training people to read the Bible well not to read culture. I think things are changing, but that's the way it's traditionally been. So my first reason is this. You're ministering the word of God, yes, but to people who live in the world, and it's important to know your audience and the obstacles that may make it difficult for them to relate to scripture and theology. Have you heard about Karl Barth's description of the pastor as a man with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. He's on the right track, uh, but now that's woefully out of date. What's a newspaper? Um, but 
I actually subscribe to one. So let me say a little bit more about newspapers. And let me recommend a book to you by Jeffrey Bilbro called Reading the Times, A Literary and Theological Inquiry into the News. It's a very good analysis about how we pay attention to what's going on in our daily lives. Jesus thought it was important to read the times, even before there were any newspapers with that name. Uh, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, he says, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. The signs of the times. That's a cousin to the spirit of the age, to the zeitgeist. Uh, that's the, one of the newspaper names in Germany is the Zeit, the times. London Times, can we read the Times, the literal newspaper and the metaphorical Times? My point is that pastors need to understand the cultural context of their congregations if we're going to reach people and communicate effectively. I've been impressed recently by the links that Thomas Thwaites went to understand what it's like to live as a goat. Um, he did this experiment. Whoops. Oh, sorry. There we go. There he is, Thomas Thwaites. Did an experiment. Uh, British scientists recognized his hard work and gave him an Ig Nobel Award. Um, <laughs> but when I think of him, I think, talk about becoming all things to all men <laughs> and goats. But he's making an effort to understand a different culture. And look at the links that he's going to. How many efforts are you making to understand the way of life of your flock? My own policy when I go to a different place is at the very least to read a couple of novels from that place that will give me an insight into the people who live there. For example, to prepare for a conference I gave to pastors who were part of the American Baptist Churches of Maine, I read the Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist Elizabeth Strout's novels, Olive Kittredge, and also the wonderful book, Abide With Me. And so I wanted to contextualize my message to these pastors in Maine. And I knew that in Maine, I was in coastal Maine, there were lots of lighthouses. And so I said, confident of my contextualizing power. The church is like a lighthouse. You know, the light of the word of God streams forth from the church. Afterwards, one of the old timers came up to me and said, you know, in Maine, lighthouses are what boats stay away from. <laughs> you know? This is when I learned that reading culture matters. <laughs> But the second reason is culture is forming the people in your congregations in significant ways. In fact, I will go so far as to say that culture may be the most powerful means of spiritual formation there is, second only to the Holy Spirit. What we need to be alert to the ways in which culture is forming folks in our churches and of what it may be doing to us. We need to ask whether and to what extent the habits and practices of the surrounding culture have infiltrated, for better or for worse, our churches. Third reason why we should read culture is because culture is the scenery and the setting in our part of the world stage upon which we've been called to play our parts in the drama of redemption. I learned from my colleague, uh, Andrew Walls, a missiologist at the University of Edinburgh, that the gospel can take root in any culture, but it also challenges every culture. And we have to understand our setting. We have to understand the cultural scenery around us if we know how to, in order to act and say things that are fitting both to the gospel and to our place. And that leads me to a fourth reason why we should learn to read culture. We have to discern what in culture we should affirm or what we can at least accept and what we ought not to accept and perhaps reject. Trevin Wax says, 
to only focus on what can be affirmed is to dull the prophetic edge of the gospel's hard truth. To only focus on what should be challenged is to fail to show how the culture's longings are answered in Jesus. So pastors need to help their congregations know what posture to adopt towards contemporary culture. There are lots of possibilities. Cultural aversion. I don't like culture. I don't want to have anything to do with it. This attitude will probably turn off a lot of the younger people in your churches. Uh, cultural indifference. Couldn't care less. I don't, it doesn't matter. It's not doing anything that has to do with me. Well, that's, that's probably just wrong and dangerous. You're likely to be blindsided if you take that approach. Some churches are opt for cultural accommodation. Let's jump on the latest bandwagon and try to ride it for all it's worth. But that's just a prescription uh, for mirroring culture, not addressing it prophetically. Others try to take culture over, maybe through the ballot box, maybe through some other means. But this is an attempt to change culture by the sword, not by the spirit. And then there's separation. We could perhaps just come up with a full-fledged Christian alternative to culture, a counterculture. I'm a native Californian, and I remember the first time I saw uh, the yellow pages for Orange County for Christians only, a Christian yellow pages. <laughs> uh, the fifth reason, though, I want to give you as to why we should read culture is that culture at its core is a kind of devotion. Like theology, culture wrestles with the big questions. It deals with the meaning of life, the path to happiness and human flourishing. And Paul Tillich put it like this. He said, religion is the substance of a culture, and culture is the form of religion. Another thinker, Ernst Becker, says that every culture pursues its own immortality projects, ways of making meaning that will stand the test of time. A lot of these projects and ways are idolatrous. So if we're going to keep our children from idols, which is what John wants us to do, we need to be careful lest everyday culture become inadvertently a form of daily devotion. And then the sixth reason I want to give you for why you should make the effort to read culture is that you need to help your congregation become culturally literate. You want them to become the kind of people who are able to read culture, but also to write it in the sense of you want them to be able to leave their mark on culture rather than culture always leaving its mark on them. We want our congregations to become culturally literate. That would be my own preference as to the various postures that we've just looked at. And my working hypothesis is that we can only engage culture rightly and communicate well if we first understand it. Uh, C.S. Lewis says, whenever you're trying to interpret something, you have to know what it is, whether it's a cathedral or a corkscrew or a culture. So that leads me to the second point. What is culture and what is culture for? The Latin term, cultura, has to do with cultivation or tending. And in English, the primary meaning in the 15th century was still husbandry, the cultivation of agricultural fields, the tending of natural growth, nature. In the 19th century, Johann Herder began to speak of cultures in the plural in relation to different people groups. And Herder argued that cultures were organic unities where land, language, and tradition came together to shape in unique ways a people's spirit. The emphasis is no longer on cultivating crops. Now the emphasis is on cultivating spirits. In 1871, the anthropologist E.B. Tyler defined culture as that complex whole 
which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. In other words, think of culture as everything people do not by reflex. Culture is everything we do that is not by reflex. It's the world that we collectively make, a world of meaning. It's the result of our freedom and our own spirit and our creativity. When did it begin? I don't think it's right to say God created culture, if it's what humans do, not by reflex. So when did culture begin? Anthropologists say that culture was invented the moment Homo sapiens prepared a meal. In the moment where the raw nature was cooked, that was the moment you could smell culture beginning. So culture is that complex whole that humans make, a shared world of meaning, but it also refers to the things in the world, uh, what sociologists call material culture, and what I like to call cultural texts. A cultural text is a work of meaning, an expression of meaning that has some kind of material to it. Uh, menus, movies, music, monuments. And if you have teenage boys, multiplayer online games. All of this is part of culture. So what is it for and what does it do? I want to mention three things. First, culture orients us, helps us to know how to get around, where we are, what's going on. It's that mental map that allows us to make our ways through our socially shared world of meaning. That the way, this is for Graham Cole, my former dean. That's the way he sees the world. Uh, so culture orients us. It gives us a sense of where we are, where to get where we want to go. The second, obviously, culture cultivates. I've already said culture is a powerful means of spiritual formation. Socrates said, know thyself. I want to add a footnote to Socrates. Know thy culture. Know thy culture. Especially given the power of culture over our sense of self. In other words, to know ourselves, we have to know our culture. Think of culture as the petri dish of the human spirit. And what grows in that dish of culture is the human spirit, the spirit of an age. And by spirit, I mean the form our freedom takes, the shape and direction that our heart goes. Culture forms our freedom and our hearts. And this is another way of saying that culture shapes our deepest desires, uh, where where our freedom and where our actions come from. And so the question I want to ask about culture is this, what kind of spirits or hearts is our culture shaping? Is it Christian spirits, cynical, capitalist spirits turning us into wolves of Wall Street? How is culture shaping our heart? And then third, what culture does it, it operates. It operates. Think of culture as the operating system of society. Our social institutions are like hardware, but culture is the programming. Culture is what society runs. To put the same point slightly differently, think of culture as that the world and works of meaning that are trying to operate your own life, trying to operate the way you live, trying to write the story of your life, or at least influence the shape it will take. Because the operating system is often uh, works in culture by absorbing us into the story that's being told. That's the operating system. And there's all sorts of stories that culture tells that serve as templates for the way we live. For example, 
did you ever wonder what's with all those TV shows about real housewives? <laughs> and uh, I bet you weren't expecting that slide today. <laughs> But uh, like many cultural memes, and a meme is a socially transmitted bit of information, like a gene, only it belongs to culture rather than nature. Like many memes, this has multiplied and spread. Uh, it's a social media disease. It's spread beyond Orange County where it started. Now there are real housewives in Beverly Hills, New Jersey, Athens, and... Dubai. So culture tries to operate our system, gives us pictures of the good life that capture our attention and may hold us captive. Paul said we were to take every thought captive to Christ, but I think we're in danger of having our thoughts and our imaginations taken captive to what Charles Taylor calls a secular social imaginary. That's a technical term, but I think every pastor needs to know this, what a social imaginary is, because it's so powerful. The term comes from a Canadian philosopher, Charles Taylor, and it's his key concept for explaining how our culture became secular. The social imaginary, what is it? It's not just a set of ideas. If it were a set of ideas, we could argue with it and attack it. But it's something more subtle. It's the story, he says, that makes sense of a society's way of thinking and living. It's the story we're all assuming. It's what I mean by the operating system. It includes metaphors that people live by. It includes all those assumptions, those culturally conditioned assumptions that incline us to feel that certain things are normal and certain things are abnormal. It's not taught in universities as a separate discipline. The social imaginary is caught. It's contagious. It's caught in culture. It gets communicated in ads and billboards and movies and films and things like that. In other words, People don't become secular because they took a course called Secularity 101. That's not how you make someone secular. You make someone secular by inviting them to participate in a society that has no meaningful place for transcendence. A social imaginary is not a theory. It's a taken-for-granted story about this is the way things are. What's so sad about this is that the Bible, I think, used to be the operating system of the Christian church. But sometime in the late 19th, early, certainly by the mid-20th century, the Bible went from being the lens for seeing the world and oneself to being just one more interesting object in the world. Wow, that is an enormous shift. I call it the horrendous hermeneutical exchange when one interpretive framework, scripture, gives way to something else. The pictures that hold us captive today are all variations on the secular social imaginary. And so any doctrine that doesn't fit into that picture, it isn't going to feel persuasive to people in our culture. Imagination, I think, is the key term here. And this is another irony of our times. We have more powerful image-making technologies than ever before. iPhone, CGI, and so on. Yet, I believe our imaginations are malnourished because they're being fed something other than gospel truth. I felt so strongly about this, I wrote a whole book about it. <laughs> it's uh, pictures at a theological exhibition. I wrote it for pastors. It didn't do very well. <laughs> What's the opposite of going viral? I, 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 <laughs> I, I think it's going nowhere. But it's a shame because I continue to think that congregations suffer from having malnourished imaginations. 
I think one of the reasons the book suffered is that people may be still suspicious about imagination as a, as a faculty. Maybe they think it's a danger to truth and theology. Not so. As C.S. Lewis and others foresaw, the imagination in the right hands can be one of the best weapons we have to combat the secular social imaginary, especially when our imaginations are disciplined by the story of Scripture. One more analogy as to what I think Scripture is and does. Think of culture as a kind of informal, lived catechesis for a group of people, a way of socializing men, women, and children into certain patterns that comprise the good life. We're always being socialized into patterns of behavior because, like nature, culture abhors a vacuum. So culture cultivates. And what it cultivates is a way of life. So to sum up what culture is and what it's for, it's the medium in which we live and move and have our being. We may not be of it, but we're certainly in it and often up to our necks. The book of culture could st is still hard to read, though, not because it's strange, but on the contrary, because it's so familiar. Sometimes it helps to leave the culture and come back to it. If you've traveled abroad and come back to it, then you're aware there's culture here. But if you don't know how to read culture, you're doomed to repeat it. You're doomed to enact the social scripts that it writes for you as your operating system. I believe each of us inhabits a world of meaning filled with works of meaning. The question is, what does it all mean? <laughs> so, how can we read culture? What should we be looking at if we want to begin reading culture? Which parts of culture give us the best chance of understanding the whole? That's a great question, and there's, there's disagreement about it. Uh, Kenneth Clark, the British author of Civilization, he thought that architecture was the best index of a culture's soul. T.S. Eliot, on the other hand, says, no, poetry. <laughs> Look at poetry. That's what's most revelatory about a culture's mood or spirit. Others say art. I think these days we could make a pretty good case for film a multimedia object. Or, if you wanted to get picky, you could focus on Disney films alone and look at the history of Disney films and how changes in the stories they tell and the way they tell them also indicate something about where our culture is going. Now, we receive cultural communications 24-7, if we're awake, that is, uh, because social media and other means of culture are always bombarding us with messages, radio, podcasts, television, and so on. So who is telling all these stories that come to us? Where is it all coming from? And again, what should we be looking for if we really want to take the pulse of our North American culture? Well, seeing as it's February, I have to say, the Super Bowl halftime show, <laughs> and of course the Oscars. Uh, these mega events speak volumes about the values of contemporary society. So I challenge you, watch them this year with your cultural exegesis glasses on and ask, what are they saying about our culture? I think they're great examples of what the Peruvian novelist and Nobel Prize winner Mario Vargas Llosa calls a culture of spectacle. Llosa says that in the past, culture's role was to edify people, to teach them character and values and make them good citizens. But today, he laments, our culture of spectacle serves mainly to distract us and entertain us. He says it exists to cure boredom and surely acedia 
boredom, sloth, is one of the candidates for the spirit of the age. The problem with cultures of spectacle is that they fall prey to the law of diminishing returns. Have you noticed the dinosaurs are getting more violent or faster or bigger? The special effects are getting more special. The roller coasters are getting rollier. Um, something to keep the thrill alive. That's what happens in a culture of spectacle. Well, what else could you look at if you wanted to read the signs of the times? I've got some advice for you. Follow the money. Follow the money. What are people spending their money on or investing in? Video games have become big business. Millions of dollars are being spent in their production and consumption. Many are marketed and reviewed the same way a blockbuster film used to be marketed and reviewed. And what accounts for the popularity of these games anyway? Why have they become so popular? You know, some people are devoted to gaming. So much so, maybe you read this story, there were reports of people dying at their consoles. They didn't sleep, they didn't eat, they didn't drink. They were so into their game. I think one of the attractions that some have suggested is that participating in a story bigger than yourself in which you can contribute something meaningful and maybe even heroic is a reason to play. You see, many of these multiplayer games involve mythic struggles. And in an age of increasing cynicism, where nothing seems ultimately to matter, gaming may meet a person's need to feel that his or her actions do make a difference, even if it's only in a virtual world. No greater love has one than this, that an adolescent lay down his avatar for his friends. <laughs> so follow the money and take note of what is trending and ask why. For example, what's behind the recent glut of dystopian fiction? So many stories about the world ending in so many different ways. Well, that's easy. People have been following the news and they're extrapolating. Well, that doesn't necessarily explain our culture's obsession at least a few years ago with zombies and vampires, and then now, this month, deadly fungi. Pope John the Paul II often referred to the West as a culture of death. Was he thinking about zombies? <laughs> After all, a zombie is a member of the walking dead, a brainless biped with a ravenous appetite for human flesh. How do you become a zombie? Is it fungi? <laughs> Aliens? TV? Uh, more importantly, what do zombies mean? Well, believe it or not, there's a book, Gospel of the Living Dead. It's a good book. It's a study of George Romero's cult classic, Night of the Living Dead. The book was published by Baylor University Press. It's a Christian book. <laughs> And what it does is it provides an extended example of cultural exegesis. The author wants to know what it all means. There's 50 pages of footnotes. Anyway, the author argues that zombie films are not just escapist nonsense, but they're grappling with serious questions about what it means to be human. And I think these horror films can have a kind of prophetic function. Romero, the filmmaker, uses the trope of the living dead to criticize several aspects of American culture. Racism, materialism, individualism. Some, those are some of the suggestions. But the other thing to know about horror films, and I'm not commending them necessarily, I just want to know why they're so popular. But the other thing I want to say is that they often explore the consequences of, trans, uh, of transgressing the boundary between the human and something greater than the human. Uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein does this. And as Christians, we can say 
that what makes a horror film horrible is that it always involves some kind of violation of the created order. That is precisely what a zombie is, the living dead. That's a violation of the created order. And I think the current fascination with zombies and maybe even transgenderism, another kind of transgression of the created order, is a symptom that people are confused about how to distinguish the natural from the unnatural, the organic from the artificial, the real from the virtual. And if there is no boundary between these things, if there is no order to creation, then what Dostoevsky said is right. If there is no God, everything is permitted. Now, I could go on and give you my own read of the cultural situation, but I think our remaining time would be better spent if I gave you some tools that you can use in your own places. Reading is still the, the big term I want to use, how to make sense of works and worlds of meaning by reading them the way we might do other kinds of texts. Again, by cultural text, I mean a material expression of our human spirit, of our beliefs and values. And I want to recommend four books on how to read cultural texts. First is one Greg mentioned, Everyday Theology, How to Read Cultural Texts and Interpret Trends. It has a long introduction, written by me, that lays out a method, but the bulk of the book consists of chapters by Trinity M. Diff students <laughs> who took my course on cultural hermeneutics and chose a cultural text and then tried to analyze these texts biblically and theologically. It includes things like, well, the signs of the times they looked at were things like um, music, film, designer, funerals, transhumanism. The book's still valuable, maybe a little dated. A second one, even more dated, is Mortimer Adler's How to Read a Book. And he likens reading to the process of uh, catching everything the author throws at you. And he points out that catching the ball is an activity. <laughs> you have to work at it, right? You have to do something to catch the ball. So reading is about catching everything the author throws at you. And what is the author throwing at you? Yes, sentences and so on but often implicit messages. The world is like this. Think of this as the goal of human life. Anyway, that book pairs well with the third one I wanted to recommend, How to Read a Film. Um, I think because films are so influential, we need to help adults and youth in our churches know how to read them. And then the fourth one is uh, by a Ted's grad, just came out, Justin Bailey's Interpreting Your World. And he reminds us that in addition to looking for meaning, we should be aware that in culture there are power and ethical and aesthetic factors in play as well. The power dimension is important. You heard of critical theory? <laughs> uh, critical theory is about being critical, that is being suspicious of the appearance of culture and suggesting that you know what's actually going on behind it, like where the power levers are being pulled. And uh, Bailey reminds us it's kind of a political act to be able to name things. If you can name something like this is marriage, that's a political act, that's a power play. Now, where there is cultural exegesis, Cultural hermeneutics will follow. And so we need to ask the question, okay, I'm willing to read. How do I read? What are the principles for reading culture? Uh, what should we be reading for? Uh, many critical theories are suspicious of something in culture. Um, again, we, it's probably right that we need to be suspicious of surface appearances. We need to ask what's really going on. But we're living in an age today where there isn't simply a conflict of interpretations, there's a conflict of interpretation theories. Now, many of these forms of criticism can be helpful, but you're pastors, you don't have time to read up on everything. So what can you do 
This isn't a new challenge, by the way. It's a perennial challenge. Uh, before we get into the theories, just look at this, what St. Bonaventure said. He said, humans have lost the ability to read the book, namely the world. Therefore, it was necessary to give them another book, the Holy Scriptures, which is full of parables about things written in the world. But as we've seen, the situation is even more difficult because we've lost the ability to read Scripture well. This comes out in Mark Knoll's book, uh, America's book, The Rise and Decline of a Bible Civilization. I've already mentioned that. So we do, I don't want us to get our priorities mixed up. The priority is biblical literacy. But biblical literacy serves the project of cultural literacy. And so here's, I'm suggesting to think of it in this way. Think of your vocation as helping congregations read that complex whole, culture, through that canonical whole scripture. Fortunately, and just in time, we have a book that can help us do that. Chris Watkin has written Biblical Critical Theory. And the title is, is right. He provides a way of looking at culture that isn't taken in by surface appearances, so he's critical, but he interprets culture with biblical categories, so he attempts to be biblical. And I think he rightly says in the introduction, the whole Bible sheds light on the whole of life. And he's also alert to the fact that what unifies Scripture is a single story. He knows that the story of the Bible nurtures our imagination. And his aim in his book is to subvert the secular cultural stories, the false gospels, by showing how their deepest aspirations are fulfilled only in the story of Jesus. So the idea is he wants to do more than explain the Bible to our culture. He wants to explain the culture in terms of the Bible. That's a bigger task, but an important one. His earlier book gives us a good case study, Thinking Through Creation, Genesis 1 and 2 as tools of cultural critique. Uh, this one's less theoretical than the one I just showed you, so I would say start with this one. It's earlier anyway. The central idea is that the Bible is something not simply to think about, but to think through. That is, we look through the Bible at everything else. And the first thing we learn in Genesis, of course, is that the world is not secular. <laughs> that secular simply means that everything is this world. No, there's a creator. That's important. God has given us meaning and purpose. We do not have to invent it. Second, Genesis shows us that God has formed things. There is a created order. And what is good are things that accord with that created order. The Psalms tell us that wisdom is the ability to live along the grain of the created order, and foolishness is not. And then the third thing we learn from Genesis, of course, is that God has given us a cultural mandate. He wants us to complete the order-bringing process in our world by cultivating things. Adam was to work the garden, and the church is to work the human spirit. I did also want to give you some other resources. Um, I'm still lamenting, by the way, the demise of books and culture, which is, uh, that was a really helpful uh, source for the kind of work I'm talking about. So two books, um, Daryl Bach's Cultural Intelligence and uh, Josh Chatra and Karen Swallow Pryor's Cultural Engagement. Um, then two magazines, um, The Hedgehog Review, this is James Davison Hunter's baby out of the University of Virginia, uh, Critical Reflections on Contemporary Culture. These, are by the, these aren't Christian books, right? But we can learn something from people who are readers of culture, even if they aren't reading with the spectacles of faith. The Atlantic Monthly cover stories, um, they're often good value, and uh, I'm sure there'd be material there that uh, you can use in your sermon preparations. And then two websites. Mockingbird, mbird.com, 
And the other one I'm excited about, and every youth pastor needs to know about this, the culture translator. Do you know about this? It's so helpful. These people have given their lives to understanding teen culture. Bless them, because that means I don't have to do it. Um, but this is a, they offer a free newsletter. They email it to you every week, and every week they'll tell you three things about youth culture that are really need to know. So I can't imagine being a youth pastor without some kind of help like that. Let me wrap things up now. Um, the most important thing I want you to take away is how important it is simply to be aware of culture and to help your congregations become aware of what culture is and what it does. That's half the battle. I think too many people, even in our churches, are not sufficiently aware of how they're being spiritually formed. They're sleepwalking. They're going through the motions of life. They're walking, but they aren't really paying attention to what's happening around them and the effect it has on their hearts and minds. They may be following social scripts and cultural programming, and they don't even know that they're not in line with the story of Scripture. I think our calling is important and holy, but it's also cultural because our privilege and responsibility as Christians is to live out the way of life, the way of Christ in the culture we inhabit. So we can't do that sleepwalking. What is the church if not an alien culture in the midst of a secular culture? So the ultimate goal of reading culture is to help churches perform our holy script in culturally appropriate ways. We want to help our people speak and do the gospel in everyday situations. I liken this to the church being a living parable of the kingdom of God in 10,000 places. That's the picture that should hold us captive, the picture of the kingdom of God, what God is doing in our place among our people even now. That's the picture that should capture our imagination. And this is my hope. My hope is that the local churches you pastor will reform their social imaginaries and thus become culturally embodied parables of the kingdom, uh, lived plausibility structures that present the way of Christ in ways that can be seen to be true, good, and beautiful. And to do that, the church has to create a world and works of meaning, always guided by the story of Scripture. So, sleeper, awake. Read the signs of the times while it is still today. Thank you.